Hello, today is October 19th, 2024. I am Han Ravess. And uh, if you're a Mormon and a BYU Cougar fan, congratulations on your win um, with 10 seconds remaining uh, last night against Oklahoma State on national TV. Um, you know, I played football for BYU. I, I, was, uh, I was kind of a bench warmer. I had two brothers that were pretty good. One was an All-American twice. Uh, both of them were invited to uh, come to the NFL, one to the Dallas Cowboys, one to the Cincinnati Bengals. It uh, didn't work out for me like that. Um, I was able to be on a football scholarship for four years at BYU, which paid for my schooling, which was great. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting. When I was a Mormon, I always wondered, you know, we're told our bodies are temples. So we don't drink coffee or tea and, uh, and, and we don't smoke cigarettes and we don't do drugs because our bodies are temples. And one day on the sideline during a practice, one of the BYU football players got his knee ripped out. And I said to some of the, and I was still devout Mormon at the time, I said to some of the Mormon missionaries that were <laughs> returned missionaries that were standing next to me, if our bodies are temples, why are we out here beating each other up? And I said, why do we have this um, football stadium that is really a shrine to personal injury? And if, the, if we're supposed to keep the Sabbath day holy, why is the LaBelle Edwards Coaches Show on Sunday night? And, uh, and, and, and then when they would feed us, uh, we would go to the training table. And this was not a healthy diet. I mean, it was beef, beef, beef. And the Word of Wisdom said we were supposed to eat meat sparingly. I assure you, none of us were eating meat sparingly. And we were all, uh, you know, um, like the linemen especially, were trying to gain weight and really pack in that red meat. On the internet, you can go to askgramps.org. Ask Gramps. And um, this person... Uh, this person fields questions from fellow Mormons. And so you got this question. It says, if, according to Doctrine and Covenants 89, Doctrine and Covenants is a holy book of Mormonism, and instead of chapters, they're called sections. If, according to Doctrine and Covenants, or DNC 89, we are to eat meat sparingly, why does the Mormon church promote the use of meat in its various functions? Because they're hypocrites, like all religions. That's why. Um, you know, and this is what you're going to see in religion, is you're ultimately going to see things break down because of hypocrisy. And then it shows, you know, a whole bunch of meat here. And if you go to a Mormon cookout, like I'm here in Utah, Mormons have cookouts a lot in the mountains. You know, you'll see people pounding down three hamburgers or hot dogs. They're not, they're not eating meat sparingly. And uh, anyway, you see, if you want to read the question from Myra from Florida, I highlighted it for you. And then, uh, you know, he, so now he tries to spin it here. I doubt very much that the church will ever put a quantitative definition on the word sparingly. Well, why not? Then how are you supposed to know? Okay, how are you supposed to know? All righty. And uh, anyway, you can read, uh, read his answer here. And... Uh, you know, this is Mormon spin, and uh, and this is this is what you get. Anyway, let's get back to um, the changing of the garments. Now, when I was a kid, I was told Brigham Young warned, Brigham Young warned that if ever you change the Mormon garment, the priesthood would be taken away from the Mormon church. This is what I was told as a child. I don't know if it was just a wives' tale, but this is what I was told uh, told growing up. Uh, anyway, uh, but BYU football is a big deal. Uh, it's a really big deal. When I was in high school, I would say the most popular Mormon in the Mormon church after Spencer W. Kimball was the football coach, Lavelle Edwards. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, okay, I, I don't even know why I went down that road. Uh, I want to show you a video clip of two people talking about the new Mormon garments. Now, I have spoken to at least 25 Mormons a week over the last six years, so do the math. It's thousands and thousands of LDS people. 10 a week would be 520, right? And so double that, over 1,000 per year, over six years, so over 6,000 return missionaries is what I believe I have spoken to roundabout. And I asked them, I say, um, is there any evidence in the Bible that early Christians wore garments? And the answer is no. Most people will say, well, Jesus was buried in a shroud. Even Mormons will say that. I'll say, okay, is there any evidence in the Book of Mormon that Mormons, uh, that, the, that the 
so-called Hebrew descendants through Nephi and Laman and all of those people, that they wore garments. And, and I get quizzical looks. I say, can you please show me the revelation in your church where Joseph Smith was told by God to make everybody wear garments 24-7 that have these special markings on them? Is there anything in your is there anything in your in your articles of faith that even mentions temple work? The answer is the answer is no. The answer is no. Uh, anyway, um, I'm going to show you this short clip, and this one gentleman, I, I I presume he's Mormon, says that the garments are a symbol of Jesus Christ, and I'm going to show you why I think that is absolutely false. Garments are not a symbol of Jesus Christ, but take a look at this short clip. Because we have church doctrine and policy. We have church culture, and I feel like we have to understand the difference between the two. Newsflash. If you are a member of any organization that calls itself Christian, if the leaders at the top have been telling you you have to do something to please God, like, it's, like they receive some sort of direction from God or a revelation, and then they switch it, like, oh, you cannot be a daughter or a son of a homosexual if you're younger than 18 and get baptized into the Mormon church. This came out, I believe, in 2014. In 2018, that was, that was thrown away. That, they ran, the church leaders ran away from that. Well, what are you going to say? God changed his mind after just four years. God licked his finger and felt which way the air was going and said, Get, dump that revelation. That was, a, that was a bad one. It's not going, the, uh, you know, we're catching too much heat for this. No, no. And so what, God doesn't work that way, okay? And so what those people will say is, you have to separate policy from doctrine. This is the great escape hatch. Because we have church doctrine and policy, we have church culture. And I feel like we have to understand the difference between the two. You know, you can't just say, liar, liar, pants on fire. You were never, never inspired. <laughs> okay. And that's true. You're not allowed just to say, liar, liar, pants on fire. You guys are false prophets. Why don't you just knock it off and tell people to stop coming to you like you're these heavenly sent gurus because you're just men and there is no one righteous, no, not one. That's Romans chapter 3, verse 10. None. There is no one righteous, no, not one. And these people that come out and just give you this baloney and then when you find out it's baloney, oh, that was just policy baloney. It wasn't revelatory baloney. It wasn't doctrinal baloney because that would mean they're not inspired. Because we have church doctrine and policy, we have church culture. And I feel like we have to understand the difference between the two. That would mean instead of saying, see, look at how they are inspired. You would have to say liars, liars, pants on fire. All right, let's get back. In case you haven't heard, it was just announced by Church News and by other news sources that they're testing a redesign with garments that are sleeveless for both men and women and a new slip and half slip option for women as well. Some people are really concerned about modesty and if this is something that's going to allow us to be more modest. Garments are a symbol of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Mormon garments are a symbol of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Garments are a symbol of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Really? Garments are a symbol of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I have in my hand Joseph Smith's translation of the Bible from 1831 to 1833. Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon on the Johnson Farm in Hiram, Ohio, went through Genesis all the way through Revelation. They did not say anything like this. Joseph Smith made thousands and thousands of changes and additions. Thousands and thousands of changes of addition. Even wrote himself into Genesis chapter 50. I don't have time to get into that right now. But of all the thousands and thousands of changes and additions, not once did he mention Mormon garments. Garments are a symbol of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. In this I have in my hand the Book of Mormon, the Mormon Doctrine and Covenants, and the Mormon Pearl of Great Price. Not one word, 
not one word that Mormon garments are a symbol of Jesus Christ. Garments are a symbol of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. You want a symbol of Jesus Christ? The cross, which Mormons will not put on their churches. They will not put on their temples. Have you heard of the Tower of Babel? Those are really big, really big steeples. Look on any Mormon church, look on any Mormon temple, and you'll see enormous spires. Those are like towers, okay? Now, the Apostle Paul made it very clear in Romans chapter 6, 14, the only thing he would boast about. Back then, you would say, the only thing that I will glory in. The only thing that he would glory in would be the cross of Jesus Christ. Okay, we have thousands and thousands of burial sites of Christians for hundreds of years after Jesus Christ uh, died for our sins on the cross. He was buried and rose. After that event, we had literally hundreds and hundreds of years where Christians uh, were buried. Not one set of Mormon garments has ever been found. And Mormons know this. Ask a Mormon. Say, please tell me the revelation that Joseph Smith received where Mormons were to receive uh, and wear garments. Show, just show me the revelation, how they were supposed to look, who was supposed to wear them. Uh, show me the revelation where you're allowed to shorten them, change them. Show me that. Okay, I will tell you, yes, Mormons modify their garments. They also modify the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 through 9, if anybody, even if I, the Apostle Paul, or an angel were to come back and preach you any other gospel from what we have preached, let that person be accursed. And then he repeated it. This is in Galatians 1, 8 through 9. You can see it on the screen. And what was the gospel that he talked about? Well, it's a gospel that you, that you don't find taught in Mormonism. I know, I was Mormon for 45 years. Okay? The gospel of Jesus Christ is very simple. It's that you trust three things and you will have eternal life. You stand on this. What I'm about to say, you stand on this. And if you believe in anything else, you're believing in foolishness or yourself, your own works. You're believing in vain. The Apostle Paul said, I declare unto you the gospel. I declare it. And he said, if you believe any other gospel, you are believing in vain. He said, stand on this gospel. He said, you will be saved if you trust or keep in memory three things. One, Jesus Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. Check out Psalm 22. Isaiah 53, just for starters. Two, that Jesus Christ was buried. Three, that Jesus Christ rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This is called the message of the cross, that the shed blood of Jesus Christ washes away our sins. This is why John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And we receive that as a gift. Wearing Mormon garments has nothing to do with it. Look, you can do your own research. The research and the amount of videos and, and, and internet information on, on the Masonic nature of Mormon garments is in a, com is a complete abundance. Joseph Smith's history with Mormon garments and, and, and Masonic rituals is very plain. Just look it up. Okay, listen, the gospel, Christ is, the gospel of Jesus Christ is very, very simple. If you're a Mormon and you're watching this, do you realize that every morning when you get out of bed, you're getting out of bed with the Mormon uniform, those garments, and you wear them all the time. They tell you what to wear. Now think about that. Go to, any, go to, go to Provo on any Sunday, and you'll see it's the best dressed city in the United States on a Sunday morning. But you will see 95% of the men are in white shirts and ties. Now ask yourself, do you think that the disciples of Jesus Christ dressed in uniforms like this that looked like bankers and lawyers and stockbrokers? Now ask yourself, do you think the 12 apostles walked around looking like Mormon missionaries? Do you think the 12 apostles walked around wearing Mormon garments with Masonic markings on them? Do, do you not understand the mind control? You've got this third article of faith. 
We believe that through the atonement of Jesus Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of Mormonism. So you look in the mirror, and if you're a Mormon, you say, yeah, okay, we'll talk about how Jesus is the Savior, but really, if I want eternal life, if I want to go to the celestial kingdom, if I want to become a god, it's on me, or I'm going to end up in the terrestrial kingdom unmarried without my children. Okay, it's on you. It's on you. It's not on Jesus Christ. It's on you. Okay, and this is what Calvinism does with the P and tulip. If I'm not persevering, if I'm not persevering, then maybe, maybe I'm not saved. Now, I'm also going to follow this up now with a short clip from this Calvinist, Calvinist pastor who, as I understand things over the past five years, has been having some sort of mental or physical affair with a young lady in her 20s, and her father exposed this hypocrite. Okay, his name is Steve Lawson, Lawson, son of the law. That's what Calvinists believe they are. It's what, it's what, it's what the word bar mitzvah means, son of the law. Okay, but let's, but let's listen to this and let's listen to how high and mighty Steve Lawson was implying he was. He was saying that, you know, you can, the, the Lord can only work through a clean vessel. There are no clean vessels on earth. There is no one righteous, no, not one. And I want you to listen to some of the things that the that um, uh, Brian says with Faith on Fire that exposes the absolute hypocrisy of this Steve Lawson. It's the same kind of hypocrisy you see from these LDS leaders in general conference, as if they're more righteous than us, as if they're better. Okay? No. Listen, I know atheists that are kinder and more giving than me, and I'm a Christian. Okay? Look, don't, don't think, I mean, listen, does God want us to be kind and giving and sharing? Absolutely he does. But that's not how you gain eternal life. And you certainly don't gain eternal life, eternal life by wearing Mormon garments. And one of the temple recommend questions is, oh, you want to get into the temple? Okay, do you wear your garments all the time? And if you say no, you're, you're not getting in. Okay, now let's, let's, let's think about this for a second. Why did the Jews go to the temple? There was one temple, not 300. It was the house of God, not the houses of God. Mormons, you've got hundreds, literally hundreds of temples. Okay, they showed up with an animal like a lamb, a, a sheep, a, a turtle dove, something that had to die for their sins. They showed up with a sin offering because they were guilty and the blood of that animal was going to atone or temporarily cover their sins. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried and rose, his shed blood conquered sin, erased our sin. That's why John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God that will take away the sin of the world. Because up until this event of Jesus Christ, it was just covered. It was, it was, it was just covered. Okay, uh, now uh, I'm going to get to this video of, of Faith on Fire in just, in just a minute. But, but think about what you do, Mormons, instead of, you know, you claim you're a restoration. You're not a restoration. You're a deviation. You're an invention. Okay? Early Christians did not wear garments. There's nothing in the law of Moses that says we need to wear garments. It's, 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 it's just not there. Nothing that Adam and Eve wore garments. Jesus Christ made them a coat of skins to wear, uh, but this, this was their clothing, not inner garments, okay? And, and there were no special markings on them, okay? But the bottom line is, Mormons, you show up at your temple in your garments, not with a sin offering, no, 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 with the recommend, with the recommend. Look, I'm worthy. No, you're not. Just go read Romans 3.10. You're being deceived. Fall on your face. Tell God you're a liar, hypocrite, and whore like everybody else on planet Earth. Tell God you can't control your tongue. You can't control your mind. Admit that you get angry. Admit that you sin daily. Yeah, do your best to you know, serve your fellow man and, and, and serve God, but know you're always going to come up short. If you're holding a Mormon temper, a temple recommend, you're a liar because there's, go and look up those questions on that Mormon temple recommend. Let's just take a look at some of these recommend questions. Remember, the Jews showed up with a guilt offering that had to die. It's blood. The animal had to die so its blood could atone for the sin of the person offering the sin offering. 
okay? That is not what you're doing, Mormons. You're showing up with a recommend. Look at me. Look at how worthy I am, okay? Let's just take a look at some of these questions, okay? It says right here, do you have faith in and a testimony of God, the Eternal Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost? Okay, do you believe that Jesus Christ um, and the devil are brothers? Do you believe that um, that God the Father had sex with Mary? Uh, do you believe that um, God the Father was once a man on another planet? Okay, these are things you have to believe to answer in the affirmative, okay? Uh, let's go over here. Do you have testimony of the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Okay, uh, this is very problematic for me. I'll tell you why. I go to Provo, Utah with gospel cards that have 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 on it. When I ask LDS people, what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? Please tell me where I can find it and please tell me what it is. You know what they'll typically say? The whole Bible. That's wrong. That's wrong. Or they'll say, it's, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's wrong. The gospel of Jesus Christ is trusting that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that his shed blood washed away our sins, if we receive this through faith, that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You ask a Mormon, what is the restored gospel? Just give me a definition of it. Give me a definition of it. Now, the Mormon church has given definitions of their restored gospel uh, online, and it includes all of the Mormon principles, all of the covenants, all of the laws, all of the um, uh, uh, ordinances, uh, necessary to put, to become exalted in the celestial kingdom, um, you know, with God, to become your own God. This is this is the Mormon gospel. When I ask Mormons what their gospel is, they don't even know what it is. And yet, and yet, they're 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 telling their bishop and their stake president that they have a testimony that God told them that Jesus Christ told them that the gospel of the Mormon Church is true. When when you ask them, well, what is it? They can't even tell you. Okay, the Book of Mormon says it contains the fullness of the everlasting gospel. But it, it says nothing that God was once a man and that you can become a God and you have to wear garments and, you, and, and, and these things. It doesn't say anything that you need to get married in the temple. It doesn't even mention temple work. Okay, it doesn't have a word of wisdom uh, in, the, in the Book of Mormon. Uh, anyway, I could go on and on and on, but I'll, I'll minimize myself and I'll uh, scroll through these so you can see the rest of, uh, of the questions here. Okay, I mean, just, just look at all of these and ask yourself, now look at this one. Are you a full tithe payer? Brigham Young said neither he nor anybody he knew ever paid a full tithe. Okay, do you pay on your gross? Do you pay on your net? There's this big debate. Okay, do you understand and obey the word of wisdom? Do you eat meat sparingly? I don't know a single Mormon who eats meat sparingly. Let's be honest, people. Okay, on and on and on. It says, do you keep the covenants that you made in the temple? Okay, including wearing the temple garment as instructed in the endowment. So, there you go. And now, do you keep all the covenants? You're supposed to give the church everything you have. All righty, on and on and on and on and on. There's just no way. Just be honest and take a look at those. They are broad and ambiguous. Okay, they're vague. Okay, now... Uh, now, I want to bounce over to this guy, uh, Steve Lawson, uh, who was, who was a, 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 I mean, he, he consider him like a Mormon general authority, okay? Uh, uh, he was a bigwig in Calvinism. He would sit on the stage with the mighty R.C. Sproul and, and, and the other, you know, so-called Christian popes, Calvinist popes. And yet, while he was doing this interview, allegedly, from what I understand, uh, while he was doing this interview, he certainly, he certainly wasn't holy, and yet he's claiming God can only work through holy people. Again, let's cut to that now, but the gospel is in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. It is not the Mormon gospel. The third article of faith says you're saved by obedience to laws and ordinances. That's not how you're saved. You're saved by trusting three things, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now let's get to Brian and Faith on Fire. So I want to play for you a few clips from this little street interview here. It was uh, first uh, recorded on a channel I'm not that familiar with, but called Off the Curb Ministries. And so it's a young guy who I, I think maybe he's from England or something, he has an accent, and he's 
interviewing Stephen Lawson about young men going into ministry. And I want you to listen to some of the things he says. And you must be sanctified by the Word of God. God will only use one kind of a vessel, mm. and that is a pure and holy vessel. Okay, so the Bible says otherwise. I know some of these men are admired and looked up to, um, but, you know, some of the things he, he says here is rather ironic considering what's transpired with him. But um, the, the fact of the matter is God spoke through a donkey. God spoke through heathen pagan kings to help God's people at time. Uh, God can use anybody. <clears throat> King David was an adulterer and a murderer. Moses murdered a man. The Apostle Paul held the clothing of people while they stoned Stephen to death. I knew a young Mormon man whose sister told me, again, this is hearsay, he was told he could not go on a mission because he was too overweight. Okay? Mormons are all about worthiness, worthiness, and so are Calvinists on their high horses, like this uh, Mr. Lawson, who was a uh, very, very eminent pastor in Texas. And so none of this is something we should condone. And there are certain sins that are absolutely disqualifying uh, sins for a pastor to be leading a congregation, preaching at a pulpit at all, of course. Um, so not condoning any sin here, but I'm just saying God's power is not limited by us. And that's the message he's giving. Let's go on. And the Holy Spirit will only fill a holy life. Well, if that's true, we're all in trouble. Because the fact of the matter is, there's only one who ever lived, roughly around 2,000 years ago, that was without sin, who was really holy and righteous. And that was Jesus Christ. None of us have been fully conformed to that perfect righteousness. Matter of fact, we're such sinners that we need to receive the righteousness of Christ through belief and faith in him. And then we're seen as holy and righteous, but let's face facts, we're, we're not. So if you're a Mormon, you're being told what to wear, and you're pretending that you're worthy to wear it when you're not. There is no one righteous, no, not one. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 9 says, Saved Christians have a righteousness that is not of their own. That is not of their own. And yet in Mormonism, we're taught that uh, we were in a pre-existence and we came down to planet Earth to prove ourselves. Ready for that? To prove ourselves that we were worthy of becoming as God is. To prove ourselves. So, so Mormonism is all about proving to God through your deeds that you're worthy. And this is kind of like the P in tulip, perseverance of the saints in Calvinism. And what a little hypocrite, uh, Steve Lawson. I feel bad for him. I don't know why he can't just admit he's a liar, whore, and hypocrite like everybody else on planet Earth who was not named Jesus Christ. You know how many times the typical person will fib during the day or the, or the impure thoughts that they will have? And don't give me this nonsense that it's just a bird that flies by you. No, a lot of times you let those birds make a nest in your head. And you know what you might do maybe at night when you're alone when these things are in your head. I mean, let, I mean, come on, let's be honest here, all right? Okay, there is no one righteous, no, not one. Paul hit the nail on the head. And if you're wearing Mormon garments, you're pretending that you're righteous. I know for a fact there are prostitutes in the state of Utah who will tell you that they have sex with tricks that will take off Mormon garments before they uh, climb in bed with the, with the prostitute. I'm not saying Mormons are any worse than anybody else. I'm simply saying, you know, put down this notion that you're wearing these holy garments, which Jesus Christ and the apostles never sanctioned, you know, you know that, that somehow you're worthy to wear these things. And this is a sign of your worthiness. You're not worthy. Okay, I, I ranted a little bit in this, uh, in this video, and uh, if you're a Calvinist watching this, I hope you're starting to see the pure folly of the P in tulip. And Mormons, I hope you're beginning to see how absolutely foolish your third article of faith is. 
We're not saved by obedience to laws and ordinances of the Mormon gospel. We are saved according to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. We are saved when we trust, when we stand on, when we don't believe in vain. When we believe three things, Jesus Christ died for our sins, that his shed blood washed away our sins. Not the Mormon waters of baptism. That's absurd. You got the wrong liquid. That Jesus Christ was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Remember, the Apostle Paul said, if you preach any other gospel, you are to be accursed. I shudder that when I was a Mormon missionary, I was just like Woody. Remember, pull the string and what does Woody say? There's a snake in my boot. Yeah, your religions teach you what to say. And it's like a string gets pulled and you just parrot what your religion has taught you to say. Better to go to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. God bless you. Have a good day.